And I also noticed on your website, there's a lots of pictures of kids that are or just on reviews, like on Goodreads. There's all these pictures of children reading your books. What is that like when you see a, a child reading the book and enjoying it and really you get that positive feedback? What is that feeling like? Well, that's the best. And in terms of all any accolade or, or book rankings or sales or anything, that is by far the best. Uh, I get some fan art sent to me. I get pictures of uh, you know, kids reading the book, which is really cool because that in the end, that's what you know I'm doing it for is, is to write good stories that uh, kids will gravitate to, that they will feel some sort of literary empowerment, you know, that you know, they can read this type of book. Hello, friends. My name is Steve, and I'm here today with Steve, another Steve, Steve O'Farrell the author of the Simone LeFray series. Steve, thanks for joining me today. Sure thing, Steve. How are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? So far, so good. Usually I don't decide until about two o'clock uh, to see how my day's going, but but uh, it's two o'clock and it's uh, been a pretty solid day, so all is good here. Awesome. Yeah, it's usually not until after I have coffee and then I'll then ask, then ask I'll be willing to answer. You know, just, <laughs> That's right. Uh, That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so uh, tell us about the Simone LeFray series that you're writing. Right, so the Simone LeFray series is a mystery middle grade series, currently middle grade. It's going to evolve as uh, the writing continues with it. Uh, right now, it's planned for six, maybe seven books. I write it for uh, Brainy Lane Publishers, which is a uh, publishing house out of Richmond. And currently, two books are out, uh, which sort of um, uh, set the stage for the, the bigger story, you know, where this thing is all going. And the third one I'm working on right now which I hope to get done and back to my editors probably by October so we can uh, work through it to hopefully release next year. Uh, but because I'm not a full-time fiction writer, uh, sometimes these things take a little bit longer for me to produce, but um, you know, sometimes it just takes that long to get these things done, but it's uh, it's middle grade mystery. Uh, it was, it just came out of nowhere and we can get into that a little bit of how it started, but uh, it's something I'm, really enjoying doing. It's the only thing I'm writing right now that I have a couple of sort of side projects going that we can talk about as well, but I find it uh, immensely rewarding so far. So what made you decide to write the book, to write the first book? Right. So somewhere in my late thirties, I guess, I started uh, considering actually trying to write something. Uh, our kids were uh, in that nine to 10 range, seven range, something like that. So we were reading a lot to them. And they were reading to us at that point as well. And uh, there was something about middle grade fiction that felt um, like I could sort of put my arms around it a little bit. I mean, there's some things that they don't get into uh, and the story seemed, uh, you know, uh, fairly straightforward. And it was just a matter of getting the right sort of uh, inspiration and the invite and the right, um, you know, idea to really go with it. So I, my mind was wandering a little bit, you know, during that time and I, wrote out a few things and summarized a few things, but they were terrible. They just seemed kind of cliche. And and I, I had mentioned this before, but I remember reading a book about reading and the what it was Stephen King and he recommended that uh, you come up with a really good idea over a couple of months and then take a year trying to really develop it to see if it's something you want to do. And I, not being a full-time writer, uh, that seemed very daunting. So none of my ideas seemed like they held any water at that point. So kicked it around for a few years, but really thought that I could do it. And it was, you know, one of those sort of life mission things that, you know, when the, when the inspiration comes, I'm going to be ready and I'm going to see it through. And the inspiration came at a uh, summer beach vacation it was with, with my wife's family and uh, was a big family, a lot of kids in the house. And at that time, most of the kids were younger. So they were like 12 and 12 down to maybe four or something like that, three. And for whatever reason that summer, they were like playing hide and seek and kind of spying on each other. That was like their games that they would play. And my niece, Ariel, was into anything Parisian that summer, any, anything Paris oriented, she was just interested in. And we were out to dinner one night and uh, the kids had made up little names for themselves, like aliases and stuff like that. And she was sitting right across the table from me. And she said, Uncle Steve, give me a spy name. And in five seconds, Simone 
spray flew out and I knew she was a spy and I knew she lived in Paris. And from so that little grain of sand started this whole idea, which then a few weeks later I wrote a um, what would be considered early chapter book. I uh, wrote that in one night, it was a little clunky, and I took a little bit of time to sort of polish that and get it um, so it was presentable. And my wife helped me with that. My wife has a, a writing degree, so she was helpful with that. And then we sort of polished it up and we gave it to her as a Christmas gift and, you know, just the writing. And uh, that was it. That was supposed to be it. And a few people read it and, you know, passed it around a little bit and encouraged me to possibly send it to a publisher. And it was sort of uniformly uh, canned uh, as a uh, viable early chapter book. I think there was one or two that had some interest in it, but uh, the good part in it was that they took the time to either call me or write me and say, you know, we think that there's something here, but this might not be the proper format, hmm. which at the time I didn't realize this because I've, I've gotten to know a lot of writers during this is you don't get a lot of that direct feedback uh, from acquisition editors and some uh, publishers and agents as well. And at some point I thought, well, I got to get serious on this. And I sent it to an editor to do a full critique. And she came back with basically the same information, which is this is not an early chapter book. This is probably something for middle grade. It needs to be a lot fuller, you know, proper novel. And you need to get started. And I spent the next year writing it and then rewriting it, rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. And after, I want to say it was, it was somewhere around the ninth draft, uh, yeah. sent it out. And it got a lot of interest and signed a deal with uh, Randy Lane a couple months after that. And here I am today. Wow. So what, what were the some of the biggest things you've noticed from the first draft to the ninth draft? I know that's a lot of changes, but what yeah. were some of the things that stick out for you that you uh, didn't realize at the time, but you realize now were mistakes you were making and things you weren't doing the right, quite the right way? Right. So I don't know that my writing style same, changed so much, but the biggest shift in the entire process was somewhere around the fifth draft. I had sent it out to, because um, I thought it was formed well enough to send it out and send it out to a lot of agents and a couple of acquisition editors. And I was kind of going back to the same ones that were expressing a little bit of interest in it. And one of them gave me the best advice of the whole thing, which is when it was rich, originally written, it was in third person limited. So there was a narrator and there was some head hopping. And uh, she said, the, what will make this most interesting for children is if you write it in first person through Simone's eyes. They will gravitate uh, to her and, and, and know more about her and feel like they're taking more possession of her if it's all seen through her eyes. So you need to write this in first person. Well, it was about 50,000 words at that point. And I thought, I got to go back and write this thing in first person, which is not an easy task because all the action comes from her eyes, all the head hopping ends. You can't jump to different scenes with different characters, you know, which is a real convenience if you can jump, you know, to the restaurant down the street that's something else is going on. So you, you kind of learn everyone's motivation. And it took me about six months to rewrite it. And I worked on it really hard. And it, in the end, it produced a dramatically better crafted and better thought out narrative because now it was it, there was that conscious thought of all being through the main character's eyes so all the action has to go through our eyes um, you know and th that was by far the best part and then after that it's just it's really you know just uh crafting the story crafting um, you know the characters and the payoff at the end all these types of things but once i was sort of on that track it made that a lot easier so what is it like to send it out to agents and then wait for feedback? Is that tough to to just be holding on and waiting for a word back? It is tough uh, because I had no I, I I have no experience with the publishing world. I, I don't know what it's like at all. I mean, in my mind, I thought, well, I'll send out like seven, and somebody will respond. You know, these you know it might be thumbs down, but at least I'll get some response on it. Maybe walk on a path, of, you know, trying to navigate you know who was looking for that in the catalog and all these stuff. And I did that, and I think in the first seven, most of them don't even reply at all, where you get an automatic uh, email back that says, you know, thank you for submission, but, you know, we're not looking for this, or, you know, it needs more work, or whatever, you know. 
bye bye. And that was sort of the the MO for most of that. And then I think I'd submitted a few more. And then once I got maybe 12 or 14 out, I started to hear back from some that showed some interest. And it's a grueling, long process. And you have to have a pretty thick skin because I'm sure that most of them don't even read it. You typically just send like the first three pages or something like that to see if it's enough to grab you. And the first three pages of my book is a prologue hmm. of the first book. So it, it's not like it jumps right into action, right? But I think it could show that, you know, I, I'm a proficient writer and there was enough there. So then some of them ask for the next three chapters or the whole book or something like that. And it takes months and months and months and months to really make a connection. But at some point I was, you know, uh, on the phone with some of them, they wanted to talk about a few things. And um, it, it was it was a learning experience for sure, but it just, it moves at such a slow pace. But I think the first book, I think I sent out somewhere in the 70s in terms of uh, queries and things like that. And in the end, I think there were eight that, that were really interesting. And then some even contacted me after it was already published to see if, if, if they would rep me. And I thought, well, I've already signed the deal. I don't really need an agent at this point, but uh, it, it is a humbling process, I can tell you. Yeah, so it's so it sounds really daunting, especially from you know not knowing the business or not knowing what you're getting into. It's it's got to be a lot of a uh, lot of waiting and just anticipation. It is. It is a lot of waiting, a lot of anticipation, and you just don't know. And and the tricky thing for me, especially, is because I had no track record as an author. I didn't have a, certainly not a celebrity, and I didn't have any built-in viewership or interest. Uh, you know where people want to see, you know, what I'm writing. So you're basically just relying on the story and whether or not it has legs. And uh, this one, because it was a planned series, I think had a little bit more interest. Uh, publishers are always looking for a series, especially if it's children's or uh, YA even, or uh, middle grade. Uh, they're looking for series because kid, kids like to collect things and like, you know, sort of that longer read. Uh, so it just it just fit into some of the catalogs or some of the wants of the catalogs of some of the people that I was creating at that time. So timing has a lot to do with it, but it is it is a humbling humbling process. I can tell. Did during that process did you ever consider self publishing? I thought about it once or twice, but the issue I had with that is I kept going back to 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 what I wanted out of the whole process, which is I just wanted to be the writer. I, I, I know a lot of people that self-publish and you know they like doing the cover and they like doing the, the interior formatting and they like you know doing all of that process, the marketing, you know, uh, getting it on bookshelves, all those things. And I, I just wanted to be the writer. I just want to write them. I don't want to really, I'm going to have some involvement in that, but I didn't want to take it on because it's, it's really a daunting process because you're really trying to bring a, a, a product to market from start to finish and you wear every hat in that assembly line from from start to finish and i have a, a a pretty full life to start with and it was just it seemed like it was too much uh, for me i wanted to be the writer only but you know for those that do it um, uh, god bless them because it is a enormous amount of work to um, you know conceive something write it get it on a bookshelf, you know, do the book signings and all those other things. It is a, it is a lot to do. So for me now, uh, only because I just, I just wanted to be the right. When you, when you started crafting the story and creating the characters, how did you create a character that children will relate to? What were some of the keys that you were focused on there? Well, that's the tough part. And you're, and I was flying a little bit blind at that point because our boys were a little bit older. Uh, but I had some inspiration for, um, you know, family kids around and, uh, it was not, I, I had to just go with my gut on a few of the things. Um, the one thing that I decided early on in the process was I wasn't, I wasn't gonna, uh, talk down to the readers. I wasn't going to make it, you know, sort of, um, you know, unchallenging to read or anything like that. I wanted to make it high, uh, high concept and I wanted it to feel like. You know, for a young reader or maybe even a reluctant reader, that they feel like um, uh, they would have a really good sense of place. You know, the settings they would have, they would be able to, to sort of see the, the characters evolve a little bit. I mean, and it stays within most of the 
characteristics of a 10 to 12 year old or a 12 year old it doesn't go much beyond that. So trying to make it relatable is sort of the trick. And I uh, relied on my wife to help me with that as well. Uh, she was a big helper in the, in the sort of the, the sessions of, you know, does this work? Does this not work? You know, the beta reading and all that kind of stuff. She was a massive help in that as well, but it's, it's tricky. And the other thing is you have to develop characters that are um, independent of one another, but then they, they meld nicely and your foils have to be well-crafted and you can't really underdevelop any of them. They all have to be uh, pretty solid and uh, something that uh, readers are really going to gravitate to. So I, I, I just went with my gut on a lot of it and stayed true to it. And uh, you know, here we are going in, into the third one. Wow. And do you have the whole series plotted out? In some respects, yes. Yeah. So the other part I didn't tell you in there was when I made that decision to go from the early chapter book to the fully formed novel, I, I just just sort of spitballed this massive narrative story. And it, it, if I would have written it, it would have been enormous. And I came to the conclusion at some point in that there was actually a series. It was something that should be broken up. So I had a really good idea. I knew exactly how it ended. And then I had these sort of points that I wanted it to hit along the way. So once I developed that a little bit, I could, see, I could really see how a book would start and end. And then there would be a definite conclusion to it. So I didn't, I, I necessarily have not plotted out each individual story uh, because I'm, the way that I write, I, as I said earlier, I know they begin and they end. And I know that there are certain things, three or maybe four things in each of the books that I really wanted to hit and then create that scene and then connect them uh, through the process of doing that. So I haven't, I have a, a pretty good sense, but I haven't, you know, gone down and actually done a summary or a full plotting of each mm -hmm. book. When you were looking for an agent, do they ask you if you had it planned out? Did that matter to them whether or not you had an idea where the series or where the book would go? Yeah, they did. I, I think most of the, the other tricky part in finding an agent was that my, what I gleaned from the whole process is they want full-time writers. They want people that produce content, that produce a lot of product so they, you know, can broadcast that or try to shop that, um, you know, to, to their, uh, to their editors. So I had one book and I had an idea for the rest of the story. Some of them asked sort of how, you know, I, I visioned it going out or how many books or, you know, maybe if you get three books under your belt. Because I didn't realize this until I was further in the process. A lot of people, when they write a series, will write several of the books before they're even published. And they might clean them up a little bit because they want to, you know, have that connectivity or, or you know, some, some good ideas pop up as they're in the third book. Say, boy, I wish I would have written this first book. Uh, but yeah, they were definitely interested in that because it's not a series until you have multiple books and then you really have something, especially if it's, if it's viable and if it's you know, marketable for certain reader types and things like that. I mean, you, you have to be, you have to be aware that, you know, you're writing for, you know, certain target audience and whether or not it hits that audience or not. So yeah, they were certainly uh, interested in, in where it might go and, you know, those sorts of things. It's appreciated. Sure. And when you writing a mystery is tough, I would imagine that writing a mystery in general is tough. How do you write a mystery that kids can follow along with and still have a mystery, but not get too deep into it before they get lost? Yeah, that's a great question. And that it's tricky because when I write them, I typically, I don't write them from start to finish, like each book uh, that I do. Now that I think, now that I've written the second one and went through the process of doing that, I have a really good idea how I'm going to write the other ones just in terms of just the basic process. And the tricky part, part for me is that I don't want to give too much away. It's it's that balance of am I giving away too much or is it not enough? Because you want them to you want some foreshadowing there. You want them to have some awareness of you know what might happen, but you don't want to give it all away. Uh, so what I try to do is uh, develop the, the payoff of it the best that I can you know, where it's in the falling action or in the, in the climax where all these things are sort of unveiled to the reader, I try to put in little things going back and usually things early. If you, if it's, if you're moving towards that in that rising action part where you're really close to the climax, if all of a sudden all this information comes in, it gets wobbly, at least I think. I think it's better if you get a couple of really good things in early, 
that the reader sort of thinks about, and then they might flash back to that a little bit, and then you do a little bit to, you know, accelerate it towards that climax. But it's a really delicate, delicate balance uh, for for uh, for the reader because you don't you don't want to give too you don't want it to be obvious, right? You want it to be, and it, hopefully you even fool them a little bit so that when they're reading it, they're sort of thinking how it's going to end. You know, they're sort of forward thinking, you know, how's, you know, what's this character going to do? How's this going to be resolved? You know, what's going to happen? And it, it, it is tricky. I would say it is a, it is a tricky balance. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds very tricky. And I was also looking at your bio and you, it's, you have won a ton of awards. What has that been like when you, when you win, when you win awards? Yeah, that's great. Uh, so yeah, it gets submitted to some, uh, award programs through the year. I think it's the first ones or the second ones already won a couple and I know it's been submitted for a few of them. Um, it's great, you know, to, to win awards, to be recognized, you know, amongst, you know, some really qualified books is fantastic. It's always kind of strange to me because you know, like, oh, I'm award winning all oh, that's that's pretty crazy. But it, it's it's a nice it's nice for the uh, marketing as well. I mean to throw those things in there. But I could say for the most part the people that run those are really serious about it. I mean, they they read them. They used to have really good critiques or some information on it, and um, uh, it's it's it is it is a really neat experience, humbling experience. You know, when you win one of these things, uh, because there's a lot of other author, authors out there that are, are trying for these things as well, and to be sort of uh, set aside or, or elevated in some way from these is is a great experience. So winning winning awards is uh, is great. Yeah. And I also noticed on your website, there's a lots of pictures of kids that are, or just on reviews, like on Goodreads, there's all these pictures of children reading your books. What is that like when you see a, a child reading the book and enjoying it and really you get that positive feedback? What is that feeling like? Well, that's the best. And in terms of all any accolade or, or book rankings or sales or anything, that is by far the best. Uh, I get some fan art sent to me. I get pictures of uh, you know, kids reading the book, which is really cool because that in the end that's what you know i'm doing it for is is to write good stories that uh, kids will gravitate to that they will feel some sort of literary empowerment you know that you know they can read this type of book and they can dig in a little bit on some things because the way I, I craft my books is they i do a lot of research for my books in terms of place and and all these little appointments with that and there's some foreign language so you know a kid that's reading it might do a little foreign language or you know, go on Google Maps to find some of these places. And it can be, you know, more of an interactive experience for them that goes beyond just reading the literature. But if I can develop a really good story that inspires these kids or, or gives some sense of wonder, you know, what might be out there, you know, you know, where are these places, you know, does it really look like that, you know, that type of stuff, uh, that's the, the best by far is, is, is seeing that come back. It's, it's really cool. And having kids as, as the primary audience is a fantastic audience because they get really excited about these things. I mean, they hold these characters dear and they, you know, I feel like I have to be like a really good steward of these characters moving forward because there's, they, they get invested in them, which is great. So I, I, I you know, look forward to, to continuing this. And also that you're an advocate for for uh, children's literacy and what can be done to help with that? What's what's something we can do just even as parents or as uh, family members or friends or what, what can we do? Yeah, so I think with, with children's literacy, so the main thing is to uh, sort of carve away any fear that they may have for reading, uh, you know, whether it's either they, are, they, they don't find it uh, interesting or uh, they have some uh, barrier where like a dyslexia or something like that where they just so they just don't like to read. When I was a kid, I was I was somewhat of a reluctant reader, but I would read uh, comic books and I'd read magazines and I'd read a novel here and there. And then as I got a little bit older, I hit a few novels that I thought were really, really good. And as I became an adult and moved on through, through adulthood, I really like reading. There's some some books out there that I think are really good. I, I, I wrote, read a lot while I'm writing as well. So it helps me as a writer. But for the literacy issue, it comes back to, I think, as parents, um, uh, one of the things that we can do is is sort of share our love of reading with our kids. You know, if they, if they just see us watching the TV all the time, 
they're probably going to just want to watch the TV all the time. But if they see us with our Kindle or a book in our hand or something like that, I think it it uh, it sets a good example. And then the other thing is, I think whatever they're reading, uh, it, you know, in some boundaries is fine. You know, if it's comic books, graphic novels, great. If they like, you know, reading stuff online, uh, pulling information off there, I think that's fantastic that they um, are interested and they continue to you know flex those muscles you know as as a reader and researcher as well so there's there's certainly a lot you know as parents we can just be good examples uh, you know put books in their hands uh you know read together you know read the same book together and just talk about it uh, those are always uh, really good things to do as well and that leads us to one of the questions we have from twitter let me just pull it up from uh, natalie ct she said i'm a, i'm an i am an avid reader but three of my four children are reluctant readers to have dyslexia. Did mm -hmm. you have a reluctant readers? Did you have reluctant readers in mind when you wrote Simone Lefray? So I did to some extent. So when I was doing the original plot summary for that, I was I was aware that I wanted to make it. I didn't want to throw too much information at the reader early, that it's sort of a nice glide for the first chapter or two until you get to that sort of point of no return. So I didn't want to put anything in there early in the book that would be deflecting in some way that, that a kid could you know, pick it up and they go from the park scene back to their uh, store. So it's pretty breezy, easy, a little bit of thing, a few things happen of interest. Uh, but I thought if I could write something where it didn't need a lot of explanation in it early, that a child wouldn't be deflected in that. But then it, it sort of ramps up from that so that, you know, you would hopefully have the opportunity through the child reading it, that they would have those successes. Like they would be able to get through a chapter and say, oh, well that, you know, there's a little French in there or a little German or something like that, but I think it added to the story or they might Google it or something like that. And it might, you know, help, help them to invest themselves more in the book. So, you know, reluctant reading is, is real. And there's some stories that connect with kids. I, I heard back from, some parents that have said that their child was a reluctant reader and they really enjoyed this one or you know they didn't necessarily you know they were starting to read up you know you get some of those readers where you have you know kids that were reading the early chapter stuff and they felt it was a pretty good one tra transitioning into that you know that beefier chapter book so yeah a little little bit of a soft push at the start and then have it ramping up so they have those successes and then there's you know the good payoff at the end which helps. So yeah, I, I did have it in mind. I wouldn't say it was something that I, I, I mean, it was definitely in mind, but it wasn't something that I, I structurally went through and said, you know, I want to, you know, I want to sort of water this part down or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely something I was, I was considering as I was writing it. Oh, to have a, a parent reach out to you like that and tell you that their, their child now enjoys reading or was a reluctant reader. That has to be the best feeling. To... Oh, it's great. Oh, it's yeah, it's it's the best. I anything like that is always you know it makes my day for sure. Yeah, that's no, got to be the best. And um, so, how I also read that there is a, a film adaptation in in production or in pre production or in production. Well, not yet. So what happened was the first book uh, won or was a finalist in a uh, a pipeline uh, contest, and as part of that, uh, they develop uh, marketing material and a strategy to market it to production companies. Hmm. So that process has been going on for a little over a year or something like that. And, uh, you know, they pitch it and I had to do some supplemental writing for that, you know, in terms of summaries and, you know, log lines and things, which was something I had no experience with at all. But, uh, you know, it was something I certainly didn't, you know, I wanted to pursue and see where it went. And uh, similar to the, uh, the publishing world, it takes four ever and the two primary issues with with my book was it's just a single book uh, but it's a series right so similar to what you were saying with with agents earlier you know if somebody's gonna produce it in like a live action or a, in sort of a film format they want to see the whole thing they want to know what they're buying up into because they want the whole series they don't want to just do one here and there but the feedback from it was actually quite positive and now that the second book is out and uh, doing well, uh, and they have that as well. So that's part of, of the bundle and we'll just see where it goes. I, you know, I, I don't know where it's going to go. You know, maybe when the third one comes out, it'll, it'll 
it'll be more interesting to them at that point. But uh, you know, we'll see how it goes. And some of them interpret it in different ways, you know, breaking it into a series. And the other issues, there's no script for it. So if there are any script writers out there, I, I would like to make contact with you because without the script, you know, they don't they don't really see what it's going to be. They can read the book, but a book and a movie, as we know, are not exactly the same thing. Yeah, and there's a few there's there's a few script writers out there. I've talked to a few of them that are writing books now, so maybe I can give you a couple of names. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for for the uh, when you when you first had the book out, how did you deal with feedback, whether it was negative or positive, whether it was from uh, an agent or from a publisher, from readers? How how do you process that? Well, it's kind of a tricky thing because you do get some bad feedback. So what the tricky thing is, you, you, at least from my experience, is you tend to, when the book came out, is you get a lot of really good feedback, right? Because it's usually your friends and family, some people, you know, on the peripheral, but usually, you know, just doing that, um, you know, they look through it with a certain uh, focus. So you, you tend to think, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's quite good. And then you hear uh, some feedback that's not so good, and then you sort of second guess it. And for me, only writing one book, you know, if you get feedback from somebody that's in the industry, you know, you take it to heart. And uh, I had some feedback that was, it wasn't, um, you know, mean spirit or anything like that. But I would rather have that because when I was talking to, uh, in the process of getting a, a publisher or an agent, I said, just tell me the truth. I want to, if you think this is a really good book, tell me, but if you think it stinks, I would like to hear that and I would like to know why because then I can make some tweaks in it. Um, but there were some uh, feedback uh, that was that it was a little sleepy at the start, you know, uh, which because it's it's a series, you know, it, it needs to build a little bit. It's not immediately going to go into the action. And stuff like that. Or that it was a little short. Uh, it's about, I think it's about 43,000 words or so. You know, they wanted more of a longer read, and I thought that the size of it was just fine. And it's just something you get used to. And then once in a while you hear, you know, somebody will post something online that you feel that they didn't even read it or they just, you know, they want to say something and give it a, you know, some some trash uh, uh, rating or something like that. That's fine too. I mean, you know, you can't be upset about those things. But one of the things that I did do was to take, I took to heart some of the uh, critiques from some of the industry people that I had, had dealings with and interjected some of them into the second book. Hmm. And when can we expect the third book? Well, I am writing it now. And I, like I said, I'd like to get it uh, to my publisher in the fall. And this last one took hmm, over a year to edit with them. It needed a lot. We, we did a lot of polishing with that one. I hope this one will be a lot more polished because actually when we were doing the second book, we did a lot of plotting for the third book. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, thinking ahead and, you know, these little complications that might come up, you know, smoothing them out so that they were set up well in the second book. So that part will be a little bit easier to do. But for me, it's just finding time, you know, sitting down and just getting words down. It's, uh, you know, that that's the tough, the toughest part for me is finding, you know, quality time to really go down and do it. Because if you only get a half an hour, you can't get anything done. You need five hours, you know, of uninterrupted, interruptions are the worst. You know, at least four, five hours. I max out somewhere around five, six hours, and I just can't, you know, the tank's empty at this point. But uh, so that would put it out sometime, hopefully in the year after that. So it'd be fall of 2023 is the hope. But, uh, you know, you will see. I was a year late on this one. But we had a pandemic and some other things happened. So, uh, you know, things do, or maybe I'll be ahead of schedule. Who knows? Yeah, the pandemic was, was something, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Luckily, uh, you know, we were sort of unscathed from the whole thing, but it definitely had a big impact on everyone's life for sure. Yeah. And did you find a lot of support in the community, in the, in the writing community? Did you find a lot of support there? Oh, yeah, they're the best. I mean, they're, they are absolutely the best, most supportive group of people that I think I've ever been around. It's, it's a really, really good, tight-knit community, and it's, uh, it's fantastic to be a part of it. But for sure, I mean, so there's some of those days where you just don't feel like writing at all. You think, no, I gotta, you know, I gotta move. You know, everybody seems to be doing their thing and moving forward on stuff. So, 
um, you know, you got to push forward, and it's it's inspiring to be part of a of a, of a global community, really, that are, you know, um, writers and, and dedicated to, you know, uh, following through with their craft. So yeah, it's it's fantastic. If if you can go back in time and talk to yourself before you started the first book, what advice would you give yourself? That's I think the mo the best advice is that it's going to take time. And I am not the most patient person. And um, in my career, uh, I, I write. I write all day. I write these thick uh, reports, these technical reports. Uh, and my timelines are usually in days and weeks. So to now flex to something that is months and years is daunting. For sure, it's it's just a it's just a completely different gear that you have to find. So you know, be patient, uh, stay true to uh, where you want the story to go and the characters, uh, but most mainly be patient. Be, be patient, you know, follow through. Don't just uh, you know latch on to something because it seems quick or easy. Um, you know, just have have faith that all of all of the work, all the effort is going to pay out, uh, pay off in the end. And I also read that you're working on a graphic novel. How is that coming along? So the graphic novel was a COVID project. Uh, in summer of 2020, which where we are, uh, COVID was really ramping up again. We're, we're in that sort of pre-fall surge. And I was editing um, Red Wolves. And actually, I was going through like the beta reading and all that. So I sent it out to my betas and stuff like that. And I was reading a lot. And I was reading a lot of urban fiction. Uh, urban fantasy, which is not normally one of the genres that I read, some sci-fi and some other things sort of out, of out of genre. And I was reading one book, and I thought it was going to go one way. I was about three pages into it. I thought, oh, this would be really interesting if it went this way. And it, of course, it didn't. It went in a different direction, which was, which was satisfying as well, really well written. And I read, I don't know, a handful of these in a month or so. And I kept going back to that idea of, well, wouldn't it have been interesting if the character would have done and what I tend to do is internalize these things. I just thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And it was COVID and, you know, everybody's sitting around. We weren't going out. Everybody's, you know, you have a lot of uh, time to think. <laughs> and there was one evening I thought, you know, what, I'll just, I'll just summarize it. I'll just do open a Google Doc and I'll just summarize it. So I did that and I just kept working on it. And I would move off of Red Wolves to work on that. It was sort of wherever my interests were. It was a nice sort of um, buoy to that. And I, then I um, summarized it, I had a really tight summary, and then I thought, well, it's a novel. And then as I started to do um, sort of the, the, uh, the more definitive summary of it, plot, the actual plotting, I thought, you know, I think this is a graphic novel because so much of it was action driven. And it, was, it would be a young adult. Or, or is that MA? What's the other one after Young Adult? But anyway, Young Adult. And I just kept working on it, working on it. And then at some point, I thought, you know, I put all this work into it. I got to do something with it. And I hired a artist to do the cover and I think eight pages. And sent it out the same way that I sent out uh, uh, my book to uh, publishers. And it's getting feedback from that. It's it's same process. It takes forever. Uh, some people didn't like the art, and that's the tricky part for me. Is is the right? I, I'm not an artist, so I, I'm only on the hook for the writing, right? And graphic novels are largely dialogue based. I mean, you have the other things in there, but the the art really has to push it, right? And um, you know, so I would go back and forth to the artists and some of those things, and I think we were pretty much like mine. Um, on the final products, but then you're sending it to one publisher and they like the art, but they don't like the writing and the others don't like the art, but they like the writing. So you're sort of at these crossroads of, you know, what do you do with it? Uh, but I think I saw three, I think there's three that are still interested in it, maybe optioning it. Um, a lot of the smaller comic book um, publishers or mid-size and the ones that do the graphic novels uh, they'll get them in the pipeline, and then it's a couple of years to develop it, and then they do them like a fall offering or a spring offering. The way they do their um, 
a lot of them do like crowdfunding and source funding and stuff like that. So, you know, we'll see how it goes. At, at some point, I really do want to do something with something with it because I think it's it's quite good. So even if I just develop it as a novel, I'd be satisfied with that, and then maybe throw in some of the pictures and things. But uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, uh, it's it's uh, you know one of those things. You know, just see how it goes. But it, I, I put a lot of work into it, so I'm, I'm going to see it through Sunday. Yeah, it's it's pretty exciting. That's a whole different type of experience and not having control over the creative process must have been kind of weird at first to not be, like you said, because some people didn't like the art or did like the art and you had little control over that. It's more of the artist. Oh, yeah. And and you just you you almost have to take the view of like a director where you say, OK, on this page, there's going to be eight cells and the first cell, you know, I want it from this angle and I want this in it. And it it's a lot of forethought to try to figure that out and not you know, being real familiar with that. I read a lot of comic books as a kid, um, but not being familiar with that. Um, you know, I, I gave the artist a lot of license to do what he felt was the correct thing to do. So that that did help, but it's still, it's, it's a highly collaborative process, you know, from the start uh, where writing books, you don't really get into that collaborative process until you're way advanced with your, your primary editing group. Where you feel like you can, you know, share and, and sort of do that. But with uh, with the graphic novel, it's 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 pretty much at stage one. You better get comfortable with that old process. Yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting, though. That's 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 pretty good. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what was what is something that your readers would be surprised to learn about you? Surprised to learn about me? I don't know. I mean, I stay pretty busy. I, I uh, chair a uh, Few things here in the community. Uh, uh, Philanthropy is big. Community service is big with me. Um, my wife and I are champions of special education and some other things in our community. Uh, we try to stay as involved as we can. Um, I don't know. In terms of like any sort of odd talent or something like that, I don't think I really have that. I used to do portraits. I used to draw uh, uh, portraits with uh, charcoals and, and uh, pastels and things like that. I got pretty good at that. I always had sort of that left brain the left brain right brain thing where i wanted to be an artist i wanted to be an artist but you know was, you know your high school counselor or your college counselor says no you need to go into finance and business but i really want to be an artist so you know finding that balance it's always been a tricky thing but i, I play the guitar and uh, have interest in music and some other other things out there so i try to stay you know full busy active purposeful life do you listen to music while you write no, I, when I write, it has to be quiet. Maybe the crickets outside, but that is it. I can't have any distraction. And music, I, I like music a lot, but it's I, I get into the music when I'm listening to that. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of like set a tone for me. I'd, I'd rather listen to the music than you know hear that voice in my head of what to write next. But no, no music. Do you uh, so you play guitar? Do you have any? Uh, so do you play? Do you play any other instruments other than guitar? Primarily the guitar. I uh, started playing that when I was a kid, and you know, pick it up and play it once in a while. I kind of it kind of comes and goes with me. Um, but yeah, prim yeah, primarily the guitar. I always wanted to be a, be able to play the piano a little bit. We have a piano. My our son plays it, but I just don't, I just don't have the patience or the time to really do it. Maybe maybe in a few years I'll sit down and uh, teach myself. Yeah. Uh, what do you enjoy reading? I enjoy the classics. And I enjoy reading stuff in genre. When I'm writing, I read middle grade. I, uh, Vicki Schwab and uh, Kelly Barnhill and some of those I think are really good. Uh, so I enjoy reading those, but I'll read, um, you know, stuff off the bestseller list. If it looks good, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a sucker for a nice uh, cover. You know, if I'm in a bookstore, I'll pick something up and read it. Uh, it's, it's all over the place. but. Usually classic fiction is where I say I don't read a lot of um, uh, nonfiction work. I like to watch documentaries. That's one of my favorite things, but I don't read. All, I think I've probably only read, you know, maybe two biographies as an adult or something like that. But I like to stay in genre and I like to stay uh, with some thriller stuff, you know, sort of the, the Grisham and, you know, all those types of uh, writers I enjoy. Now that you've had a chance to write your own books, do you yeah. read? Do you read differently now? Do you try and dissect things the way that in ways you didn't before? 
Mm, no, I try to enjoy them because I see writing as an, an entertainment and enjoyment. So I just try to get immersed in them. And I'm one that I have to finish a book. If I start it, I'll, I will drag myself across the line to finish books. And I finished some that, you know, two chapters in. Just like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this, but, uh, you know, I'm no quitter. So I have to finish them out. And the other thing that I do read, and something I didn't anticipate, Steve, is when you become an author, publish author, you get sent a lot of books. Hmm. People send you their art copies or they send you, you know, beta reads. Can you please read this or do you have any insight on that? So I read quite a few of those, uh, you know, hand, probably in the last two months, I've read four, maybe five of those. So, yeah, I read a lot of those as well. And they're all over the place. They're from science fiction to you know, steampunk stuff to, you know, everywhere. Historical fiction. Uh, so I like doing that. I like jumping around a little bit. Um, that's that's always kind of fun. Hmm. And what's a book that you read recently that you really enjoyed? Uh, I read an art copy of uh, Claudia Olten's book. It was uh, historical fiction. I really enjoyed that. I thought it was really good. I read... Um, uh, in the middle grade stuff, I read uh, The Girl Who Drank the Moon. I thought that was really good, very creative. And uh, was it City of Bone by Vicki Schwab? Really good. And, oh, and I read uh, The Graveyard Book uh, by Neil Gaiman not too long ago. I thought it was really, really good. He's, he, is, he is on the top of the pile in terms of writing. He's just, just yeah, brilliant in the way he executes some of these. So uh, they've been good. Um, a few others in there? I don't know. I, it's funny. I'll, I'm sort of a bulk reader where I won't read it all for a little while and then I'll read a bunch of books and then out, you know, sort of, I'm not, I don't always have a book in my hand. I'm not that type of person, but, uh, you know, I just sort of get inspired to read in, in sort of clusters, I guess is the best way to describe it. And with reading different genres, have you ever thought about writing in a different genre? Yeah. The other thing that I, that I've done is I did a, a really good summary of like a classic fiction coming of age type story that would revolve around, uh, the Civil War, where where we live in, in Western Maryland, the, the, there's a couple of battlefields around here. And you hear a lot about the history. And uh, I sort of formed this one story that I thought would be pretty good, summarized it. And I think someday I will write it because I think it's, I think I need to evolve a little bit more as a writer, get a little bit more confident. Um, uh, but I think someday I'm, I'm, I'm going to write that. Oh, wow. Excited. Yeah, I'm really excited about your graphic novel. That's uh, I'm I'm a big graphic novel person, so it's always exciting, and it, it's it sounds really intimidating that whole because you you have experience with publishing with your with your books, but then you get into the whole comic book publishing. It seems like a whole different world. It seems that way. I, I think there's definitely some parallels. With, uh, the time it takes, um, it's a lot of work. I mean, just to do the queries and the submission, it is a lot of work. Uh, you know, an artist can take weeks to do a page and, you know, that's not even fully finished. That's just inked, and, you know, with the, the uh, diagram bubbles and all that kind of stuff. It, it is a lot of work to pull these things off. And the, the other thing about, um, at least my impression of the graphic novel stuff is I think when people look at it, they, they get an immediate impression of whether or not they like it or not. You know, they like the art or they don't. They like, you know, the structure of it or, or something like that. And, you know, the story... Uh, maybe better or worse, uh, but you know the art is is it's visual, so it, you know it, it can really pull you in. So it's got to be what that person is looking for. And the, the other thing that I found in this whole process of publishing is not everyone's going to like your book. Mm -hmm. I mean, for whatever reason, they don't like Paris, or they don't like <laughs> whatever. They don't like mystery. I mean, they don't like purple on the on the cover or something like that. And I think it's the same way with uh, the graphic novels as well. But there's some things that they're, they are looking for. So I think if you sort of, if you can stay within those guardrails a little bit, it gives you more opportunity to, uh, to, to hopefully get a, get a deal. So, you know, we're safe, you know, fingers crossed and you know, hopefully something comes on it. But I, I put so much time in at this point, I'm definitely going to do something with it, whether or not it goes that route or goes uh, more proper. Now, but. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So I do have just a couple more questions for you. Sure. But that I like to ask every every guest. So okay. the first one is, do you have a favorite family recipe? Do I have a favorite family recipe? Well, as a kid, my mom made a couple of different cookies that I really liked. Of course, her sugar cookies and uh, chocolate chip cookies were awesome. My wife's Mediterranean chicken 
is really good. Uh, I could eat that, you know, seven nights a week. It is excellent. Uh, recipes. I'd have to think a little bit. That's a good question. I don't know. I'll, I'll come up with five things after we're done here. But, uh, you yeah, know, the cookies and the rice, uh, uh, Mediterranean chicken seem to, to uh, jump out. How often does she make the Mediterranean chicken? Not enough. Maybe like twice a month. <laughs> Maybe <that's> my... <laughs> uh, so the next one is, uh, what was your first job? What was my first job? I work. I think this is I think I had two jobs the same summer, and I can't remember which one was first, but I worked at a, a Pet Boys, uh, you know, auto, like an auto zone type thing, and I was like, a, I had stock shelves, and I swept up and stuff like that, and I think the same summer I worked at a, um, count, a, a county regional park, you know, that had like softball fields and golf course and stuff, and I worked at concessions. <laughs> what did you learn from those experiences? The, well, you learn how to deal with people a little bit. Uh, those are, you know, uh, those are things that you have to, I guess they're kind of surface oriented, but, uh, you know, basic things, be on time, you know, uh, you, know uh, you know, be respectful of the places you're, you're working for. Uh, and you, you definitely do need, you definitely do acquire those skills of you know, working with other people and you know, customers can be unpleasant at some periods of time and you just, you know, you just roll through it. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how much we learn from those early experiences in our lives, you know, the first jobs or those, uh, those early experiences we have, how that carries us through the rest of, of, our, of our time. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the, the last question I have for you is if the roles were reversed and you were in my position, was there a question that you would have asked that I did not ask? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, is there a question that you didn't ask? Well, I'm trying to think. I mean, a lot of authors talk about process, um, and I think I unveiled my process a little bit in there. Uh, and there's really no, there's, I think everyone does it differently. And I think every story actually calls for a little bit of, of a different way to do it. Uh, I made a ton of mistakes uh, in terms of like execution of a book. Uh, for both of these, I mean, all the mistakes that you hear about online, you know, and drafting, and, you know, whatever else can happen in these things. But the process is one that I think uh, is evolving. Uh, you know, as, as I think you write more, you, you get more efficient in the way you're doing things, and uh, you know, that process is always is a tricky one. I think if you ask, I think if you ask an author to to, to precisely articulate their process, mm -hmm. they would have a really hard time doing that. <laughs> Oh, this. <laughs> and was there was there anything that you learned about your process that you've uh, you've learned you learned early on that you've implemented since then? Yeah, I think the main part for me now is because, like I said earlier, I have a really I have a pretty good sense of how they start and end, how each of the books start and end, and then picking those three or four points in the book and then weaving them together. Uh, is definitely the way that I'm, I'm going to do it from now. And the other thing is, you know, it's okay to skip around. You know, you don't have to write it from, if you do prologues, you know, prologue through the end, you don't necessarily have to do it that way. You know, write, you know, jump, and feel that if I jump around to the chapters that I want to write first, um, it keeps it a little bit more exciting. And then you're sort of, you, you're encouraged to finish it, right? Because there's some chap chapters in there that are a little bit lower action or things like that. Or, um, Somebody asked me that earlier uh, in, a, in a different podcast, that the falling action chapters are the most challenging for me to write because there's there usually is less action and you have to tie everything up, but you just can't say, you know, you just can't bullet point them the end, you know, and you have to be pretty skillful in the way that you, you tie all that up to be satisfying for the reader. Uh, so jumping around within the, the narrative is, is, is just fine. Oh, that's good advice. So for someone who wants to connect with you, wants to find more information about you or your books, where is the best place to connect with you? Right. So online, uh, the books are internationally offered. So they're on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and uh, everywhere that books are sold. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find online, uh, active on, um, you know, all the, the social media platforms, Instagram and Twitter, and Facebook and TikTok now. Uh, probably be getting a website together here, not too long. 
into the future, maybe another month or two. So I'm I'm out there online. You can uh, Google me and you, you'll see uh, all that stuff come up. So I'm not too hard to find. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming by to chat with me about your books and your process and your favorite recipes. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure. Well, thank you for having me, Steve. I've, I've really enjoyed it. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Sure. See you.